is this the reading room? Yes, I'm Saad Mansour. And I'm Travis Howard. This is Reading Room Talk. Thank you for pressing play. We have Dr. Okay. Asante Dixon on the mic. So, okay, so went through <laughs> Cornell and then basically... Well, I guess specifically, can you tell us about the MCAT? I think that's another major hurdle that people, uh, you know, yeah. got to get over. So the MCAT. So the MCAT was this thing that everybody was talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and you heard it from the day you knew you were going into pre-med. Yes, sir. And at Cornell at the time, um, you know, this is before, you know, you have your iPhone on you all the time and you went to go see your counselor. <laughs> and I can remember she pulled out this Cornell book and it was essentially an XY graph. And on the X axis was your, um, like your GPA and then your science GPA on your Y. Yes. And she put her finger down where they intersected and it was like, red, yellow, green. And wherever your points intersected, that's where she would say you should, you maybe, or you should not apply to medical school. Oh, wow. Based on this graph? Wow. Okay. Based on this graph. And, but, but in a way you can't blame her, right? I mean, in a school this large with so many pre-meds, I mean, she can't sit down and talk to everybody. Yeah, that's real. So, Well, it's important that you recognize that, though. You know, like, it's important that you recognize that fact as well. Yeah, I did recognize that even as as ignorant and, you know, naive as I was as a college student, something in me was not willing to accept somebody sliding their hands on a piece of paper and telling me what I could and couldn't do with my There you go. There you go. That's the goal. Where'd you get that from, Dr. Dixon? I mean, probably from my parents, you know, I mean, parents always telling you, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And eventually when you leave the house, um, you have that instilled in you, you run with that. You can do it, you can do it. And even when many times you failed or many times you struggled, you still get up and you say on your own, even though your parents are five and a half hours away, you don't need them anymore to tell you, you can do it. Yeah, exactly. And so that's the reason why parents, good parents, are good parents. It's that they set you up with the tools you need to go off on your own and fight that battle. Yeah. And yeah. what? not only was I not willing to accept what this chart told me, because um, the chart put me in the yellow, which meant... That eh, yield? That was the- yeah, <laughs> kind of like, you know, yo, <laughs> you know when... You, you know when your plane's about to take off and you get ready and you like text your text your your family and you're like all right we're t- we're, we're taking off and then the pilot's like we're gonna have to hold here <laughs> and they pull off on the side exactly and let the other planes go so you see all the planes going in front of you and you're pulled up on the side for yeah, you know, another yeah, yeah. thirty five minutes that's what yeah um, no, that makes sense that's uh and. That is not uncommon. I feel like, you know, I was told the same thing. I think uh, when I talked to my guidance counselor at Ohio State, she was like, you know, you need to do, you need to do some research, do a post back. And I was like, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, you know, we will, we will likely get into this later, but this is all part of, all these experiencing all these experiences that I'm sharing with everybody are experiences that come together to create mission. Right, right. And exactly. What I you know, and I currently am engaged in a major mission that I used all those experiences. Mm-hmm most of which I will never get the chance to share with you or your audience because there are so many yeah. to now change the trajectory and change the support level of students who are now back at that quote unquote Ohio state or Cornell or wherever you are. Mm-hmm. And you no longer have to run that road alone. There you go. Yes. I love that, man. Tell us yes. more about that mission. Yes. Talk that talk. 
So, again, for the listener, you know, we're going all over the place, but, you know, such is life. Just walk with us. Exactly. Yeah. So, when I left Cornell, or as I was graduating, I made the realization that I wasn't ready to apply to medical school. Mm -hmm. And so, what I did was... I got wind of this thing called a post a mm-hmm. post-baccalaureate program. Mm-hmm. I'd never heard of it before. I honestly don't even remember how it came to me, but this is what we call real, realistic self-appraisal. Mm-hmm. Many students don't have realistic self-appraisal. What I was able to do was I was able to look at my grades, look at my maturity level and say to myself, you can apply to medical school, but I didn't feel comfortable that I was ready for medical school. Mm -hmm. And half of that discomfort honestly came from the fact that at Cornell, I didn't really start to settle in academically probably until the middle of my sophomore year, Mm -hmm. right? That first year, that freshman year, It was party. (laughs) It was getting up early to eat. Mm. It was strawberry syrup. Strawberry syrup. It was fried cheese. Let me tell you, when they had fried cheese, son, I was trooping. (laughs) Yeah, the tent outside. Trooping. (laughs) Trying to get when when they had fried cheese with marinara. And in those days, they didn't call them mozzarella sticks. They would just call them fried cheese. I see. Right? Mm. And they didn't make them in little sausages. They made them in triangles. Right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, I hear it. (laughs) And then in typical fashion, and I know I'm deviating, but I'm coming back. In typical fashion, just like Cornell was very segregated, guess what? So were the dining halls. So when you came up to what is now Robert Purcell Union or RPCC now is what they call it, mm-hmm. that was the North Campus main dining hall. And when you went in there, there was like a black and Latino section. Wow. And when you went to dinner, that was a night out. Like, like, <laughs> We used to be shaping up to go. Right? You get uh, your you get your tea outliner. Tight. You, you make sure you're lined up. You know, if you had a little goatee, you make sure your goatee is is lined up because you're going game. to dinner now. That's game time. Yeah. Oh, it's game time. You'll be right? seen. You'll be seen. <laughs> you will be seen. Right. You make sure you know. Make sure your Jordans are are straight. And you know, there was a mirror right in front of the elevator. We would take turns. Everybody straightening up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we would go to dinner, we'd go to the area, and it was literally like, you know, that old show Cheers where Norm would walk in and everybody would be like, no! Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> so so it was very similar for us. As I mean, people would walk in, people would be like, hey, yo! <laughs> All right. All right. Right. And it would be like <laughs> different people walk in and, you know, arms up, and you would eat, and then you would be there for like hours. And wow. that was a time when people would just be at the table, just talking and vibing and decompressing, right? Mm-hmm. And beatboxing and, I mean, and so anyway. <laughs> That's um, amazing. I, I, use, uh, I use this to explain to you the development, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody starts from somewhere. And... Uh, Many times people may look at me and say, oh, man, you must have been pretty straight laced and this, that and the other. I mean, everything's relative. I mean, I was not out there shooting people or shooting at people. Right. But I engaged in a lot of young people nonsense, so much so that my first 18 months of college, I was really trying to find I, I, I was fascinated by the idea of living alone in this world where I can do whatever the hell I want. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I, and I was accustomed to going to school in high school, you know, I was a national merit uh, scholar in New York and I was in honors track. I was accustomed to when I study, I get an A. Mm -hmm. That's right. When I got to Cornell, 
studying got me a seat. Yeah, that was average. <laughs> oh yeah. man, yeah. And that's a real. That's a real. That's an important realization. And that really hurt me. It hurt me because I didn't know how to fix it. <laughs> and what I realized was studying an extra four hours didn't change my grade. I got a seventy six last time, so I studied five more hours this time, and now I got a seventy four. So what happened? How'd you fix it? (laughs) Well, I think what I did was this is where, you know, as we deviate back and forth in time, what we're talking about is we're talking about the evolution of a student. And the evolution was I wasn't really comfortable with my academic progress. And so that's why when I heard about the postback, I said, maybe this is an opportunity for me to learn how to study. There you go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's, in, that's key. That's very important. You can stare at a page forever and until yeah. you know how to really go about it. it, it you know, you, yeah, you have to learn that. No, that's that. That's the that's the transferable skill that has to be learned. Yeah. You know, it's just you just have to learn it. I period. Have to learn it too. Yeah. yeah. No, everyone. Right. <laughs> and so, and so that's why. Um, the post back was important for me. Now, for those young people out there, this is where we again pick up with the evolution of the student. There are many students who they just want to be able to say that they applied to medical school. They mm-hmm. don't want to take the time to figure out, are they ready? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then they apply and one of two things happens. Most people, if they're not ready, they are going to apply, have a really crappy credentials portfolio and get rejected. Mm -hmm. And not only are they gonna get rejected by one school, but they're gonna get rejected by every school they apply to. It's very expensive. Now now you're in debt, Mm -hmm. right? You're spending money that you may or may not have. Ego banged up. Yes. (laughs) And there you go, okay? And so here we talk about why I do what I do today, because here's an aspect of education that many people don't consider, which is that many of us as science people, and we are all science people if we're doctors, we are existing every day with some really shot up health and wellness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that started from those college days of trying to beat that pre-med gauntlet. Yes, sir. And there are many of us that applied, got rejected, and that rejection changed our lives forever because we weren't able to recover from that rejection. Mm -hmm. And um, so brought me to Georgetown because Georgetown had a pre-med, I'm sorry, a post back program called the GEMS program. Nice. And that GEMS program changed my whole life again, because that was the year I met up with Dean David Taylor uh, and Dr. Arthur Hoyt. And that year was a year for me to figure out how to study, because up until that point, I didn't know how to study. I think I was just relying on quote unquote smarts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And relying on what many of us rely on, which is just stick to itiveness, which is in high school, you know, yeah, if you study an extra two hours, you're going to get a 98. Yeah. Now that gets you far in high school. Right. You're going to get a 98 if you study two extra hours. You know, if you get up at six o'clock in the morning in 11th grade in high school and go over some stuff before your test, you're going to get three or four extra questions. Mm hmm. But when you bring that into the college environment, particularly in that biochem pre-med environment, that doesn't fly. It's not now studying more hours. Now it is knowing how to study, strategizing Mm -hmm. what classes should you be taking. There are so many kids out there right now that are doing very well in classes but they're taking the wrong classes. So when they apply to medical school, they're going to get rejected, not because they're not smart, but because the medical schools are looking at their academic portfolio and they're saying, why the hell would he take this class? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So 
I was going to say, I think you made a point earlier. You made a point earlier about, um, you know, knowing your prereqs, knowing that, you know, they're looking at your GPA, but they're also looking at your science GPA particularly, which is, uh, you know, big thing that I learned too. So that's very, it's, it's very important. And so the, 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 so I'm, I'm bringing to the gems to the end and then you guys can come on with the next one, but it's that year really set me up to then be ready to apply to medical school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I applied to medical school that next year, I came in with a total different level of confidence. I, I bet, man. My, my wife, she did a post back program and she said the same thing. Like when mm -hmm. she hit day one of medical school, she hit the ground running. You couldn't, you couldn't tell her she couldn't do it. Why? Because she had been exactly. exposed and figured it out. Um, and it, it's a shame that you can go through an undergraduate program and not really feel like it's large, right? You don't get that one-on-one. -on -one. You don't get that small group attention where I mm -hmm. feel like maybe you need to, you get those, you know, someone can help you learn those skills during those first four years. Exactly. No, that's exactly right. So well, tell us more about the actual GEMS program. It's a one-year program at Georgetown. It's a one-year program at Georgetown. I, l let me um, preempt by saying this. Guys, remember, the system is not made to inform you as to how to navigate the system. That's exactly right. right. <laughs> That's true. So, so you cannot, looking back in retrospect, of course nobody told you about options. Of course nobody told you about how to assess what classes to take. Of course mm -hmm. nobody told you that somebody needs to help you understand how to divide your time mm -hmm. and that when you're applying there's a certain way to write the uh essay the personal statement and mm -hmm. you know like nobody's telling you those things no different than you know people who have made it big in the stock market are not going to get on youtube and tell you exactly what they did to become a billionaire it ain't gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's right. But I will, I will say that, like, you know, one of the points of doing this uh, podcast is to, like, put these particular details out there. And, um, you know, I just remember when I would talk to people, it would just be a lot of vague advice. And it would be, yeah. like, a lot of, like, oh, you know, you should just do this. You know, it just wasn't very, like, particular advice. It wasn't, like, strategic. It was just kind of, like, general advice. And you're right. I mean, it, it's, it comes with, uh, you know, insecurity. You know, like, if you feel like, you're not there yet, then it's tough to like, you know, help someone else make it as well. So, you know, I think the more that we can get, you know, this type of information out to like people in our community, you know, the more successful people will be because, you know, people in other majority communities, this information is like out there. It's free. It's, it's like out there. they have it's it, you know, they talk to their mom, they talk to their dad, talk to their aunt, uncle, like this information is out there for them, but it's not necessarily out there for us. Right. So, so let me give you, let me give you an example. Um, when you are writing, this is something that, you know, we currently teach a lot. So, okay. So I started a company. Yes. Four tell years us, ago. please, please, please. We need to, we need to know about a this company four years ago with that same gentleman who changed my life in that post back at Georgetown. Dean David Taylor, mm -hmm. I came up about maybe five years ago. I was just kind of like doing a lot of lectures to medical students. I still lecture a lot back at Georgetown Med. And I was just thinking one day, I said, hmm, all those experiences that I had, all those walls that I ran into, all those challenges that I had, I wish there was a way that we could help students coming up learn those lessons without running into the same walls that I ran into. Yeah. Yes. And I wish there was a way that we could systematically teach students how to navigate the journey to physicianship. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, however, as much as, much as I have, you know, I have a clinical background, I'm a physician, and I am a student of the master. I'm not the master. I said, I need the master. 
That's right. And so I thought and thought of how am I going to approach this well-respected veteran medical educator at Georgetown Medical School. I thought about it. I thought about it. And I know for a fact that throughout his decades of being at Georgetown, there have been countless students that have come to him with a quote-unquote idea as to I'm how sure. they can go into business together. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so I remember I told him, I was like, listen, can you meet me um, after work on such and such a day? I have something I want to talk to you about. And, I, and he was like, sure. And he met me at this little coffee shop in D.C. Um, and we sat down. And I said, you know, small talk, small talk, you know, how's the chicken? And then I was like, okay, I have this idea. And I laid out my idea and my vision as to what the company would look like. And I told them, I have the vision, I have the idea, but I need the master, I need the engine. And that's you. Hmm. And we can reproduce all those decades of work that you have given and sacrificed yourself for hundreds of doctors who are responsible, uh, who you are responsible for creating. All over the world, and yes. All over, and he kind of was eating his chicken and he was kind of like nodding and saying interesting, kind of in a typical Dave way. He was like, interesting, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> right? Pondering. You know, Interesting. Excellent yeah, excellent chicken, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, again, I'm still tight because he still didn't give me an answer. He just said interesting, right? Mm. And then he said, um, he said, you know, I like it. I like it. Mm. And the, that was the, the beginning. Uh, uh, the chicken and the idea. Oh, uh -huh. excellent. All um, right. And he and that was the beginning of Ascension Medical Educators. Um, and we came up with the name Ascension because we are ascending through the journey to physicianship. There you I go. Love it. Yes. Um, and medical educators, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we started off four years ago, very small, you know, just working with one student at a time. And it really wasn't even about money. It was just kind of like, getting our feet wet because he is still full-time at Georgetown. I'm still full-time. I'm chairman of radiology and, you know, it's more than full -time. during the day doing oh, yeah. chairman of radiology and all that nonsensical stuff and doing this quote unquote on my free time. Right. <laughs> so yeah. that took years to grow and culminate and I'm happy to say, and I know I'm skipping a lot, but we can come back to this at a later time, but I'm happy to say, as of this moment right now, Ascension Medical Educators, uh, which is a customized professional medical educational service and coaching firm mm -hmm. uh, with a specialty for underrepresented students. Yes. We currently contracts with two medical schools, one in the pipeline. Nice. Uh, we have about one class every 30 to 60 days of pre-medical students. Mm. And we are in the process right now of securing a deal, a partnership with the United Negro College Fund, who oh, very nice. reached out and said that they would like us to be their, um, their partner in medical education for their students in the United Negro College Fund's arsenal. I think they've got like 30 That's or 50,000 students across the country that are UNCF colleges. Yeah. Um, and we, I'm hoping that we will get that done by hopefully this March. I'm sure you will. Um, 
And we will, and so you can imagine going from four years ago, it was just an idea to right now, we are 2022, we are looking to make some major, major, major moves. And there are some schools that I would like to tell you about, but I can't because we're kind of in talks with them right now. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, but we are engaging both at the med school level, helping medical students with their learning and strategies mm -hmm. and undergraduate. And we actually have contracts with some schools in their postgraduate. So like Excellent. if you're a surgery resident or a family practice resident and you need assistance, we are actually engaging with those institutions to help those residents. That's awesome. Now, how can any, how do people get a hold of you or get in contact with essential medical educators? So um, it's Ascension medical educators. However, um, the website, we did a little New York slang. We just shortened it. Like we got an accent. So it's actually Ascend Med. <laughs> Right. So it's A S C E N is in Nancy, M is in Mary E D dot com. Right. So ascend med. Right. Because when people say ascend, they don't say yeah. the D anyway. They'd be like, yo, you ascending, yo. So, <laughs> so ascendmed dot com. And Perfect. my email is my first name dot last name at ascendmed dot com. And Hopefully Perfect. We can put that in the show notes for people. Oh, this read. will definitely be in the show notes, and Absolutely. we're gonna and we're definitely gonna run this back because we need we need more specifics the next time you're yeah. on about nah. your actual about experience. The program. At, well, the program definitely, and also your experience at Georgetown and your experience going through radiology residency. But we're gonna bring it back soon. Yeah, we're gonna have to, man. I, I love. I have to touch on what you've done. You saw a need. You, 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 you know, you bumped your head along the way. And you're trying to prevent others from doing the same. Exactly. It's, it's, it's wonderful, man. It's wonderful. It, I mean, there's, there's nothing to be said about it. I mean, this is, uh, can change people's lives, you know, change the course of families, multi-generational wealth. I mean, these are all attainable goals with, uh, you know, with your company. So that's, it's, it's amazing that you're doing it. And, uh, again, we really, really appreciate you, uh, making the time for us. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, I, I think these conversations are not only fun to have because I know that we're talking the same language and just like, you know, when you grow up with, when you're talking to somebody who grew up in your neighborhood or in your town, there's certain mm -hmm. things that are unsaid. We, we don't have to break down everything word by word. Right. You know, we understand and so these conversations are essential because one, it fosters community. Yes, Two, exact people, people who are listening to you guys on a regular basis and me just for here, this fleeting moment. Oh, no, no, you're, you're coming like, back. All right, fine, I'm coming back. <laughs> what, what, what I'd like people to understand is that don't get thrown off by the stories and the jokes because even the stories and the jokes play an integral part in the development of a professional 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah i agree with you man as much That's as easy. as much as uh, others might want you to negate those stories and and the and those you know those encounters that we have they all make make you who you are and can help lead you and guide you in the direction you should go. Exactly. And you have to be comfortable in your own skin. You know, if your skin is, you know, you've went through certain experiences, you don't want to have to like bury that. You don't want to have to um, not be able to be honest with yourself. And, right. Be you true. know, you just want, yeah, you want to be as true as possible. And, you know, that's the thing that we want to do with the podcast. And I'm sure that's what you're going to be teaching everyone when they come through Ascension as well. So we really appreciate you coming and uh, we're going to run this back. We're going to, we're going to find you. We might oh, do yeah. this. We're gonna do this live next time. Exactly. And I would. I'm down. You know, I'm down. You guys pay for the it. videographer and pay for the room and the food, and I'm there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I love it. I love Laid it. Laid it out. Yes, it's done. Consider it a done deal. But we really appreciate you being with us, and uh, we're gonna run it back. Till next time. Stay low. Keep firing. Keep firing, baby. Oh!
That's that's perfect. Y- y'all got to remind me next time to tell you about the Cornell water balloons. Okay. Uh, doesn't was, sound like they I, had water in them. Well, hey, I got stories for you, yo. I got stories for you. <laughs>